Okay, so let me try to sort through this one. Uh, I'm sitting in the office at a uh, Zen Buddhist retreat center somewhere south of Seoul, Korea. Uh, it's the administrator's office. It's also my bedroom, uh, oddly enough. The uh, uh, center is oh, hundreds of years old. I'll take pictures of it tomorrow. I'll walk through and, and uh, run the iPad and show you some of the uh, different buildings here. But uh, essentially, the, this journey began. This video may be a little bit longer than my usual ones. Uh, so if you're not interested, you might as well snap it off right now. But um, the journey, this journey started uh, for this particular uh, meditation center. Uh, Simon is a client and a friend of mine, and he came to Seoul, Korea uh, three years ago, I guess. Maybe maybe less, but he uh, called me after he had participated in a Zen Buddhist retreat, an eight day retreat, and he said, "Boy, something happened. Something really shifted." Uh, he said, "I think it shifted so quickly for me because of the work I've done with you." And while I appreciated it, I don't. Um, I just I said, "Okay, thank you for the compliment." He said, "It's coming up again, and I I think you should do it." So. Uh, being on this quest for vitality, for aliveness, uh, for enlightenment, if you will, uh, for many, many years now, uh, I came over last year and the can course was canceled, but I had already made my reservations and stuff, so I came in when I did some work here. And uh, so then Simon said, the course is back on. And we, I said, you know that course that Simon's been talking about is on, and Nicole said, boy, I would really love to go. I've never been to Asia, and I would really love to do something like this. Yeah, so we planned it. Uh, he set up a talk. I, I have a talk which will be posted on YouTube in a couple of weeks, I guess, uh, at the Dharma Center at the university uh, for Buddhist studies. It's a Dharma talk, uh, and uh, it's a really neat auditorium, but, uh, but you'll see that when you see it. Uh, so Monday we came down, and uh, we set, we came down by bus, and they served us like chocolate and strawberry milk and it was like these monks handing out food and it was very nice but it was like I thought real odd food um, fortunately we stopped at a roadside rest and I got a coffee but uh, we got here and Monday night was the first Dharma talk with the master and he said okay you're on a retreat you're and he speaks only Korean he speaks through a uh, another monk who translates and he said, you have some instructions. And he said, please do only a few things. You only have, you're only responsible for a few things. We'll provide your meals. You can, uh, we'll provide you with a place to sleep. And uh, your instructions are, I'm going to ask you a question. And all you have to do is find the answer to the question. And, and he said, don't try to do anything you've ever done before, because you're not going to find it by doing that. And he said, trust me. Uh, so uh, he asked the question, which was kind of like, what is the sound of a fish flopping in the air if there were no water around, or something like that. It, it was much simpler than that, actually, much simpler, but I don't want to, uh, it's not my question, and I don't, you know, it, so I'm just going to make one up. And so he said, okay, I'll go. I said, go what? Go find the answer. Let's <laughs> take go find the answer to a fish flopping in the air somewhere. And he said, yes, how do we do that? And he said, just go find it, go sit. And don't do what you have done. And he said, and don't keep asking the question over and over again, because that's not what you're trying to do. You don't want to ask that question over and over again. And so all of these things, you just, you go and you sit. And uh, that's what you do, pretty much. And I'm thinking, am I supposed to be listening for the birds and connecting with the uh, vastness of one or whatever? But I don't know. I've got some very seemingly simple simple uh, set of instructions. Trust the man, the master that uh, told us what to do and go ask the question and don't do what you've done before. And I've done some meditative stuff and it's been always active. It's always been doing a mantra and stuff. And, uh, but I don't meditate that well. So it was easy not to go and do that. Yeah, it's, there's monks here, there's nuns here, so they've done all these years of meditation, so they would fall into, apparently, what they said was their old ways of meditating. 
and uh, then <laughs> you're, you're sitting in this for days, for days. And I don't get the point of it. It doesn't make any sense. You find yourself uh, asking the question, right? And then you realize that's not it. So you tell your mind to shut up and quit a asking the question. But uh, Monday night, I, I never left the meditation room. I'm not, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, I didn't think I could sleep very well anyway, and I sat and didn't sleep very well and slept a little bit, but this uh, process was consuming. It was, and as the process continued, it, uh, the master would come in and have Dharma talks and, and say, okay, here are your instructions again, and he would tell you pretty much the same. Here's the question. Uh, go sit and look for the answer. Uh, you'll come up against barriers, you'll come up against a wall, once you come up to the wall, and it's just a wall of your mind, it's just a thought. Um, See so if you can just relax and find the answer. He said the answer will be experiential. And uh, so we had set through another Dharma talk, and he said, okay, I'm going to have you sit in, in, in meditation now. And so the first night they got here, they said we were, they were going to have us sit in meditation for an hour, which I don't know about you, but that's a long time. And it got to be what I thought was more than an hour. And they came in and said, we apologize. You are working so hard. Uh, we made it two hours. And that was one of the things that the master said that kind of unloosened things for me. He said, if you think this isn't working, one of the clues that it is working is that you have been sitting in meditation for far longer than you've been capable of doing. And I thought, well, that's true. My ass was sore, my crossed legs were numb. I kept having to change positions. But I had sat for a couple of hours in a meditative state. And so then on the third actual day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, we had a Dharma talk. That's where the master comes in and talks to you and you know, says, do you have questions? He was taking questions by then. Before, he wasn't taking any questions. And if the question was, you know, how do I do it? Just He said, just go do it. Just don't, you know, just go do it. And... Uh, so he talked, and then they said, we're going to meditate for 30 minutes. And I'm thinking, yeah, sure, it's going to be you know, one or two hours with these dudes. But uh, they uh, started the meditation, and uh, Dr. Kim, one of the, I don't know if he's a monk or a lay person or what, but he has this bamboo stick that makes this real clack when you hit it. He said, I'm going to hit the bamboo stick, and it's going to touch your heart. And I've been in seminars like that before, and uh, most times it doesn't, so I'm sitting there rather skeptically, and back, he hits his stick, and there's a in my heart, and I think, that was a coincidence. And he does it again, and it does it again, and it keeps going as he tacks the sticks, and then my body goes into this involuntary shaking, and I start crying. And it's a little embarrassing. Uh, there's people sitting all around me. I don't know if they know what's going on because they're sitting in their own meditative states. And he had told us to close our eyes. And at one point, uh, somebody said forcefully into the room, open your eyes. And it felt like they were talking to me. But my body was shaking. I mean, it was like being in a washing machine. Kind of. uh, tears coming down. And uh, uh, when the stick stopped clacking. He said, all the sounds will impact your heart. I think randomly, I think synchronistically, uh, bells started ringing. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was part of the meditation, but these bells started ringing, and it started to open, it started to bang on my heart as well, so it's really kind of confusing and uncomfortable, and I'm still shaking and crying. And so then... Uh, after a while, they come and tell us, you know, uh, you can go eat lunch. Now, we've been eating Korean food, uh, monastery food, uh, which is white rice and really spicy vegetables and things, uh, but they don't seem to go together. It seems like they throw them together, but it might. It might be part of the process. I'm not really sure. But I was thinking, boy, I haven't had 
much fresh fruit, and I'm not a fresh fruit person. And we go downstairs, and there were there were watermelons. Once I saw the watermelon, I realized they had been serving us watermelon, but that was the only fresh fruit. And I was particularly hungry for apples, and there were apples on the thing. And so I, I was standing there before lunch, stuffing my face with apples. Uh, I felt rather gluttonous, but I really didn't seem to care about it. But I was out in an altered state. I was out in a real state of delight. Uh, states that I live for, work for, have, have sought for years. And, and we did it through this process of me not knowing what I was doing. It sounds kind of like my work, but... But, uh... So, then we're, we go through some things and they, you know, they suggest that we keep meditating and, and, but there's no, like, pressure to meditate now. There's nothing, no question or anything. Uh, and I'm watching my wife, Nicole, go through meditations and she's shaking a little bit and things and she's struggling and things aren't making sense to her. And uh, she's a little grumpy, so I stay away from her. And... At one point, I think, well, I'm going to go walk. There's beautiful hills around here. We're way out in the country, and there's beautiful, beautiful hills. I, I, I'm going to find my way on this big circular loop. And I see the translator monk, who, one of the things that the master said, he said, the answer is, the question is the answer, kind of. And he said, oops, I may have gone too far there. That was one of the things that opened things up for me. Um, i trying to think. There was a couple of things that he said that it's like, oh, my. I see, I see now what we're trying to do, kind of, although I didn't know how to do it or how I was doing it. That was the thing. Uh, sitting in meditation, uh, just trying to do this didn't make sense, but it, it, he said, here are the steps that it's working, uh, that you know that it's working. Oh, I said that earlier, that the meditation, uh, if you can sit in meditation for this long a period of time, something's happening. So I went through this neat experience, and I saw what I thought, I, I made a conclusion about it. And I saw the monk who was translating as I was starting this hike, and I said to him, is the huado, is what you're looking for in Korean, huado is a, is a, like a chi, I think, it's a not, I'm not really sure, I haven't, it's, it's definable, but it's, it's, it's vast. And I said, is it serious? And he said, it's neither serious nor... Or I said, is it, yeah, is it serious? Because I saw so many people take it seriously, and it felt like it was really light. And he said, it's neither serious nor light. And it put a little thing of being doubt in here. Like, and so I started walking on what I was gonna, thought was going to be a two-hour hike. It ended up being five hours, I think. I had to go all the way over the mountain and come back because I got lost. I didn't, yeah, I guess I, I, I didn't know where I was going, so I came back the same route that I was on. Oddly enough, in those trips, you know, I went to the top of the hill and there was a, a little meditative center up there and a Korean man saying, yes, you can do it, you know, in an hour. And uh, I made one wrong turn. It seemed logically like the right turn, but today I went back with Mr. Kim, so I see where I made the turn, but I still would have made that turn on my own. In fact, I almost insisted he do it, because uh, it seemed counterintuitive at the time. But... Uh, there was this Korean man, and he said, yeah, I'd do this, and I got down, and I got last, so I had to come back, and I missed the Dharma talk uh, for that evening, out walking, and uh, I'm thinking, okay, this is perfect, this is okay, but I wasn't real comfortable about it. As I came back into the Dharma center, I thought, oh, everybody would have missed me, you know, I'm so special, and uh, realized, of course, that nobody missed me. Uh, but Simon came up to me, because Simon's here at the retreat, the man that got us into the retreat, he's at the retreat assisting, and he said, have you seen Nicole? And I said, no, and he said, mm, I think she's ready for her interview, because after you get out, you go talk to the master, and, and he listens to you. And so I talked to her, and she talked about her experience, and whoa, 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 I may have her do a video on this for y'all, just so she gets, uh, like it was way out there, and, uh, and, between that and missing the Dharma talk and the walk, I got really uncomfortable. All of a sudden, all the doubt, all the insecurity, all the uncertainty came back into my system. And I said, Nicole, I've lost it. Uh, the sense that I had, I've lost it completely. And so I slept another night in the Dharma center itself. I slept and meditated and meditated and slept. And, and uh, so the next morning we had a Dharma talk and I was tired. I was really, really tired from not sleeping well, from being so uncomfortable all night. And in the morning, they, uh, after our meditation, one of the people came and said, the master wants to see you. And uh, he talked about hitting people with a Zen stick, and I, I thought he was going to knock the shit out of me because I was so uh, uncomfortable in my